So really we need to finish on RTS, CTS and how that helps us uh, in some cases, especially in the cases where we have hidden stations. Uh, before we explain that, yesterday someone pointed out an error in one of my, uh, another error in one of my pictures. So I think this is in the handouts I gave you yesterday, number five, the fifth diagram. It was the case where we use basic access and there are hidden terminals, A and C are hidden from each other. And there was an error in one of these numbers, and this is a fixed version. So in, in yours, this number here is, I think, 416. It should be 466. So you can fix or change that in your handouts, or you can download this updated picture. So this number should be 466. And in yours, the back off was 27 slots. So the number here was 27. So that I didn't have to fix all the other numbers, I changed it down to 21. So in your handouts, you should change this number 46, well, what is now 466, to be from 416 to 466, and the back off from 27 down to 21. And then I think you'll get the correct answer, the same answer. Uh, that's just the correction from yesterday. And of course, all these pictures are on the website uh, to be downloaded if you need. The final picture we went through, and we'll go through again, is how we can use RTS-CTS to handle this situation or improve the ch uh, chance of avoiding collisions in the presence of hidden terminals. So the problem with hidden terminals or hidden stations is that, for example, when two clients are on either side of the access point, but the clients are outside of each other's range, they cannot sense each other. They, when they sense the medium to check if someone's sending, they don't know if the other one is sending. The result may be both may transmit to the access point, causing a collision at the access point. So here's an extreme example where A has some data to send, starts transmitting, and then sometime later B has some data to send, it starts transmitting because they don't, it doesn't know A is sending. Even, even if there's a small overlap, so from the access points perspective, it receives everything from A and then there's some, just a small overlap in time of the transmissions, we consider that at a collision and it's very difficult for the access point to understand either of those transmissions. So from the access point's perspective, this small overlap in receiving two transmissions means both of them are lost. It cannot understand either. So that's our normal assumption. If any, any part of the transmission overlap, we lose them both. So that's a problem. The idea of RTS-CTS, request to send, clear to send, is to ask the other node, Am I, can I send? And the other node, the access point, may respond with a clear to send and then send the data. So it looks more like this, where client A has some data to send, sends a short RTS message, I, I request the opportunity to send to you, if the access point knows that, or doesn't think anyone else is sending at the moment, then it will send back a clear to send, saying, no one else is sending at the moment, you are clear to send your data to me. And once we receive the clear to send, we can transmit the data. In this case, importantly, the clear to send informs B that someone else is about to send. Recall it's a, a broadcast medium. When access point sends a message to A, in this case the clear to send, it's also received by B. Even though it's destined to A, B receives it, and B realizes, because it's a clear to send message, and it's to someone else, it realizes that someone else is about to send, and therefore it will not attempt to send. It will defer. And the duration that it defers for 
is informed by the access point because inside the CTS message there's a field that stores the duration of the upcoming transmission. So both the RTS messages at the RTS message and CTS message have a field in there indicating the duration of the upcoming transmission. So B defers, doesn't attempt to send. A sends its data and ACT comes back and then B can start again. Diffs, back off, RTS, CTS, data, ACT. We don't get a collision in this case. Collisions are bad because they usually mean a larger contention window, a retransmission, it takes much more time. That's the idea of using RTS, CTS to handle hidden stations. The overall trade-off is with, without RTS-CTS, so we, when we use what's called basic access, just send the data first, more chance of collisions when we have hidden stations. With RTS-CTS, we can reduce the chance of those collisions, which is good, but we introduce some extra overhead. Every time we send data now, we must waste some time in sending first an RTS, getting a CTS back. So we're less efficient. So there's a trade-off there. If we're likely to have collisions, then using RTS, CTS can be beneficial. But if you're in a scenario where collisions are unlikely, then using RTS, CTS is not so beneficial. So there are two types of frames that we've introduced now. So we, we now have four frames in the data transfer phase. They're all small, so 20 bytes for RTS, 14 for clear to send, about the same size as the ACK, small compared to most data frames. And both the RTS and CTS have an extra field to indicate how long the transmission is going to take called the duration field. And that describes the steps. Uh, and uh, the example we have, you have in front of you in the handout, we see those steps in practice. As normal, diffs, back off, then send a request to send. And between between frames, in the same way as between a data and an ACK, we have a short interframe space. Between a RTS and responding, we have a short interframe space. Between the CTS and responding with the data, we have a short interframe space. So between frames within the one data transfer, this short interframe space is used. Really, the short interframe space gives the, the device enough time to uh, detect the signal, check the received frame, and switch its radio from receive mode into transmit mode. Our radio is usually either, tr we use half duplex, we're either receiving or transmitting, not both. So B receives the request to send, checks it's OK, switches from receive mode to transmit mode, the short interframe, interframe space gives the receiver enough time to switch back to transmit mode and then send transmit the CTS. It would be better if there was no short interframe space but to give the hardware a chance to check the frame and, and, com and swap between transmit and receive mode, it's defined as a, a short period of time. Importantly, RTS and CTS carry a field including the duration of the upcoming data transmission. It can be calculated because A can predict, it knows in advance how long it will take to, to transmit the CTS in response. It knows how, long it's, how many bytes of data it has, so it can calculate how long the data transmission will be. 
It knows how long the ACK will take to get back. It knows the short interframe spaces. So when we send the RTS, we can set the duration from here up until the expected finish time. In this case, 238. 10 plus 20 plus 10, 168, 10 and 20. And you get the duration of the expected data transfer. Check that. In the RTS. If we add up the times, the short interframe space is 10. CTS is 20 in this example because we set it at 15 bytes. 20 microseconds. Short interframe space, 10. Data, we know in this example is 168. I know because we calculated before and you did in your quiz. Short interframe space here, 10, and the ACK, 20. What do we get? You add them up. And you get 238. That's set in the, the RTS field the RTS duration field. So when B receives that RTS, it knows someone's about to transmit or the, the data is going to take that, that duration. And when it responds with a clear to send, it sets the duration to be the remaining, which is 30 less than the RTS duration. Because it, RTS is from here to the end, CTS is from after the CTS to the end. So 238 minus this SIFS and CTS, minus 30, from here to here. Short interframe space, data, SIFS, ACK. And in this case, our hidden terminal, C, doesn't receive that request to send, because it's too far away. But because it's within range of B, it does receive the clear to send. And it reads the duration field and realizes someone else is about to send for 208 microseconds, so let's defer for that time. What does NAV mean? The name of the, the time it defers as a technical name so you'll sometimes see it come up called the network allocation vector. It doesn't, not so useful for describing what happens, but there's a name and you may see it in some, some textbooks or some uh, specifications, the network allocation vector. It's described in the lecture notes on one of the slides. But the main purpose is that from the CTS, C knows to wait to defer for some period of time. It doesn't check the medium. It doesn't check if someone else is sending. It automatically assumes someone else is sending. And when that period is up, then it can start again, diffs back off and so on. Any questions on how RTS CTS works? Uh, the question I think and was similar yesterday what if C transmits the RTS at the same time as A? Is that correct? Then we can have a collision. So in this specific example, C wants to send at time 180. I made that number up. Where did it come from? Where does 180 come from? I made it up. Good. But in, in real life, what, what triggers? 
C wanting to send data. An application wants to send data. So C is a laptop, for example. Someone does something on their web browser, and that data flows down to the Mac layer, the wireless LAN card, and that triggers the Mac to say, OK, now I have data to send. In this case, I chose that the user did something, and at time 180 after station A started, the user had data to send. So that's why I say I made up this number 0, 180, and so on. Think of it as the time at which the user has data to send. And that is random, effectively. We cannot predict that in advance in most cases. It depends upon what applications being used, what the user is doing. So it's hard to predict what this will be. In this example, if it is 180, we see C, station C doesn't get to start the RTS. What if it was slightly earlier? What if at time 112, I got it right, at time 112 C wanted to send data? Instead of time 180, what if the user at computer C did something a little bit earlier and wanted, as a result, data to send and C has data back here at time 112? Well, it starts the diffs, it takes 28, it takes us to 140. It starts the back off. Can it sense anyone sending at time 140? No, because at 140, no one is sending. So it starts the back off. And three slots was the back off. So it would finish at 167. Does it sense anyone sending? A starts sending at 163, but C will not sense that because A is too far away. So the result is that C will, will transmit the RTS because it starts at 167. No one else is sending, so transmit the RTS. And the result will be C is transmitting the RTS from 167 for the next 20 microseconds, 187. But at the same time, A is sending its RTS between 163 and 183. From B's perspective, there's a collision. Okay. So there can be a collision on the RTS there. One six three. There's a collision whenever the two frames overlap in time. So if, let's draw A, if A is transmitting, at, in our case, A is transmitting at 163 to 183. If A and C are transmitting the frame to B and they overlap in any time, they don't have to fully overlap, but partially overlap, then we consider a collision. Yeah. So if, if this started two microseconds earlier, 110, still we'd have a collision. Okay, so for different values, we still get a collision. And if there's a collision, 
similar what we get with a collision in the basic access. There will be no response, they will time out, increase their contention window and try again. Okay. And try again which means diffs back off with a new value, RTS, CTS, until we get it right. The duration to, to, to send one data frame depends upon the data size, the amount of payload, in our case 1,100 bytes, header, and the data rate. In our case it was 168 microseconds, if you can calculate those values. The th if you wanted to calculate the throughput, in this case we could. If we throughput, we can look at it from two perspectives. The throughput of a, of a station, looking at just one station, for example, the throughput of station A or the throughput of station B or C, or some, sometimes more useful is the throughput of the network. Consider all the stations. In this case, we've got three stations. Between zero and the end time, 734, how much data, how much payload is delivered? One, two times 1,100, 2,200 bytes. Throughput would simply be the, the data, the payload size divided by the total time, 734. In the previous case, when we used basic access, when we had a collision, it's still two payloads were successfully delivered, divided by 908. The throughput would be lower in this case, because the total time is larger. So by using, using RTS-CTS, we can avoid collisions and potentially increase the throughput. Because with RTS CTS, it's 2,200 divided by 734. Without, it's 2,200 divided by 908, which will be smaller, smaller throughput. Any other questions on RTS CTS? So you can do the exam next week. Let's return to this point. We can still have collisions on the RTS. In basic access, we saw a collision between the data frames. Potentially, with RTS-CTS, we can have collisions between RTS frames. So we can still have collisions in RTS-CTS. What's the chance? Or which one is more likely? A collision in RTS-CTS or a collision in basic access? Which one's more likely in the same hidden terminal scenario? If we're using RTS-CTS, we can have a collision amongst the RTS frames. If we're using basic access, we can have a collision amongst the, the, the data frames. Which one is more likely to occur? Why? So data frames, why the data frames? Because they're longer, they're, they're larger. And let's, let's try and analyze that in a very informal way. Uh, so with basic access, Uh, here's our data frame. Actually, I'll make it a bit longer to emphasize the fact. 
data frames are normally normally much larger than the ACK, RTS, and CTS frames. So if we have a long data frame. And so I'll just draw A and C. Assuming A transmits the data frame at this point in time, at what time can C transmit the data frame, a, its data frame, such that it causes a collision? Well, a collision is when the two data frames overlap in time. So, if we started transmitting here, and there was a small overlap here, that would be considered a collision, because they are overlapping in time. If C started transmitting, so this is C, let's say here, there'll be a large overlap in time, all this period will be an overlap, a collision. If C started transmitting, of course, at the same time, obviously there's a collision. The entire frame overlaps with A's transmission. If C starts transmitting just before A finishes here, there's a collision. So if C starts transmitting the data frame such that the, its data frame will overlap with A's, we get a collision. What's that total time? If we start here, through to here. If C starts transmitting anywhere in this time, there is a collision. What does it depend upon that time? The data transmission time. In our example, it was 168. This is 168. So let's put some numbers to it. So what's this time? It's double 168. What is it? 336. That is it. A starts transmitting here, it lasts for 168. C's data transmission also lasts for 168. Of course, if they start at the same time, collision, full overlap. If C starts at a time such that the end of their transmission just overlaps with A's, a collision, which is 168 or slightly less than 168 microseconds before A starts. Similar, if we start just before A's transmission completes, we'll get a collision. In summary, if C starts transmitting any time within this 336 microseconds, we get a collision. Or generally double the transmission time of the data frame, assuming they're the same size. So any time in which they both of them overlap, assuming they're the same size, then if A sends here, if C starts any time the data transmission before or before it finishes here, collision occurs. The same applies if we're using RTS-CTS. Try and draw it. We have A transmits an RTS at some time. Let's make it a bit bigger. Just R. If C starts just before, or, or before such that they just overlap here, a collision. Or if C starts anywhere between there and just before a finishes its transmission, a collision. 
where this time is two times the RTS time. In our example, is an RTS is 20. If C starts its transmission within that period of 40 microseconds, we can get a collision because the two RTSs will overlap. <coughs> where 40 is two times the duration of a RTS. Same concept here, if we have the data using basic access, if C starts the transmission any time between uh, in this period of 336 microseconds, we get a collision. The next thing is, well, which one is more likely? Assuming they want to start transmitting at random times, Remember, the start of transmission depends upon the user. We cannot predict that very easily. So assuming A transmits at some time, C starts at some random time, the chance of C starting in a period of 40 microseconds is smaller than the chance of C starting in a period of 336 microseconds. Therefore, the chance of collision in the RTS-CTS case is smaller than the chance in the basic access case. That's difficult for some people to get their heads around, so any questions on the concept there? With the, our example, the point is that D data frames are usually much longer than RTS-CTS. Collision occurs when the frames overlap in time, even partially. And then the question is, what's the chance that two stations transmit in some period such that they overlap in time? Well, that chance or probability depends upon how much time can overlap, how long the frames are. The longer the frames, in the data frames here, the more chance that two stations transmit in an overlapping time. The shorter the frames in RTS-CTS, the less chance that they'll transmit such that they overlap. And hence, less chance of collision between the RTS than there is between the data frames. You can actually do calculations on how that probability is, but we're not going to. Any questions on that? Hmm? Where is the meeting room? <laughs> You'll learn to read. <laughs> yeah. Um, what about if C starts sending RTS while B is in the tips? What if C starts sending the RTS while B is in the tips period? What would B do? Uh, B, B may not respond with the, uh, the CTS then. It will not be clear to send. If we get a collision there, that will be a problem for B. It will not respond. Uh, if, if the RTS is fully received before the CTS, then B can send the CTS and A and not send a CTS to C. Yes, but everyone who, because it's a broadcast medium, everyone receives it and they take notice of the CTS. So CTS is sent from B to A, but C also receives it and, and processes it and listens to what it means, in this case, that someone else is about to send. So if C sends an RTS to B, since... B has already received one from A, B will not respond with its special CTS to, to C. Yeah. So C will have to wait. But if C has not finished transmitting RTS, then B would, would just not respond to CTS to any, anybody? Yes, we could get a collision there and, 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 and uh, it will not respond to either of them. Any other questions about the, the chance of collision? You don't have to calculate the probability, but just understand why with longer frames it's more likely 
than with shorter frames. And that's the big difference. RTS is generally shorter than a data frame. Much less chance of collision. But still a chance. How did I get the answer? Duration of 238. Uh, so in the RTS, station A has data to send. It does its diffs, it's back off, and then it sends the RTS, and it sets a field inside the RTS, the duration field, and it calculates that field. How does it calculate it? It predicts how long it's going to take to successfully finish this transfer. And it's easy to predict because from now on, from after the RTS, that, that duration should be the duration for one SIFS plus one clear to send plus another SIFS plus the data transmission time, which can be calculated because we know A knows how much data it has to send, it knows how fast it's going to send it, plus the SIFS plus the act time. So it calculates basically from 183 up to 421, which is 238, and sets that value in the RTS. So that's the duration until the end of a successful transmission, or successful data transfer. And the 208 is the same, except it's from this point to the end. And B can calculate that. If you want to find the throughput of A, station A, finding the throughput of the station A when there's just one data frame is not, in fact, the finding the throughput of anything when there's just a few data frames is not statistically, uh, normally statistically accurate. So from A's perspective, if I asked you to find the throughput, I think you would say from the here to the end of the act. Okay. But in fact, that's the throughput of one frame. In reality, you send many frames, and you need to calculate across all those frames, and that will be more accurate. All right. The throughput of the network is from here to the last to the end of the act. So think of from the start of the diffs to when the act completes. That's the time. But in practice, Throughput is normally calculated across multiple frames because it varies. So, longer frames, more chance of collisions. Hence, we have this short RTS frame. And after that, the collision should be much less likely because the CTS informs others that we're about to transmit. And they should defer. what's remaining. What if there are no hidden stations? Which one's better? Basic access or RTS-CTS? Basic access. If there's no hidden stations, in most cases, then there'll be very few collisions. But we still can't have collisions. How do we get collisions? One way to get collisions is this the hidden terminals. What's another way? How do we get collisions? We've seen two cases. The same back off time. So here's one collision due to hidden terminals. That's one cause of collisions. Another one which we saw earlier, same back off time. So there's still a chance of collisions even if there are not hidden terminals. 
similar using RTS CTS can reduce the chance of collisions so in general so there's a trade-off now RTS CTS better to reduce collisions but more overhead because we have to send an RTS and CTS so which one do we use in practice we use both so we see the, com the trade-offs between the two your wireless LAN device can switch between them and the way that it switches between them depends upon how large of the, the data frame is so for every data frame your computer has to send it makes a decision do I use basic access or RTS CTS so you normally don't use one or the other it depends upon the data frame size there's this what's called an RTS threshold some value a parameter for your wireless LAN device if the data frame is smaller than that value then basic access is used if it's larger than or equal to that value that threshold then it will use RTS CTS the idea here is that when you have a large data frame the RTS CTS overhead is relatively small compared to the large data frame and the overhead is not so significant so it's better to protect against collisions but when you have a small data frame the overhead is quite large so it's better just to go to basic access one way to illustrate that RTS CTS small data frame let's say we have a small amount of data to send and then ACK for the total time there's also a diff some back off back here the data transmission is just, a, is just a small percentage of the total time in this case but if we have a large data frame we have an RTS a CTS and then a large data frame then an ACK then the data transmission especially the payload is a larger fraction of the total time so when we have small data frames RTS CTS overhead is large and therefore inefficient but with larger data frames the overhead is relatively small and therefore it's okay to cope with that overhead so when we have large data frames use RTS CTS small data frames stick with basic access and often in your on your laptop or your mobile phone you can change that parameter the RTS threshold there are other factors that determine what is the best value when when should or what should the threshold be it's hard to predict it depends on other things like how how fast or how often stations are sending how many stations are in the network we've considered cases of just three or four stations a b c and d what if there are 20 stations it gets more complex and there are more chances of collisions uh, but RTS CTS has extra overheads and there are even other problems which we don't attempt to describe that can, can arise so it's a complex relationship between using basic access or using RTS CTS in practice the threshold defines when, which one is used for each frame I think we're about finished we'll go through a few of these slides but I think you've seen most of this or we've covered most of the remaining slides at least the things that I want to cover uh, 
earlier and in the quiz. So any questions before we quickly cover the remaining slides? There may be one or two new things that we'll, we'll cover in these, but most of it we've seen. This is just some summary of some of the performance issues of the, the MAC layer protocol. What we've just looked at, DCF. Uh, we've calculated throughput in some cases, so we've seen the physical layer offers some raw data rate, the, the speed at which we can send our bits. So we can calculate some transmission time, but unfortunately not all time is spent transmitting the frames. Some time is spent sending headers, control frames, into frame spaces that is not sending, waiting for back offs, and sometimes spent retransmitting. They all reduce the efficiency of our MAC protocol or reduce the throughput. So the throughput of the MAC layer is the rate at which the user data, the payload, and importantly, is successfully de delivered to the destination. Not the rate at which it's sent, but if we have a collision, that doesn't count as successful delivery, the rate at which it's successfully delivered. We've, we've done some calculations of throughput. We've seen yesterday and also I think in the quiz, if you've done the quiz, you'll see that you need to calculate the throughput in some cases. We've seen these parameters, so the parameters that we've used differ for the different physical layer. And I think you did this calculation or close to it in the quiz, which is this approximation of if there were no collisions and no deference, what's the best case we could get? Well, it's diffs plus back off, plus data, plus sifs, plus ac is the total time. And here's some values, for example. Or well, average back off, we said if we choose a number between 0 and 15, on average, we'd choose 7.5. So the total time is our diffs plus 7.5 times 9 for the slot time. Depends upon the data size. In this example, it's 1,500 bytes plus header divided by the data rate, 54 megabits per second, plus SIFs. Here, my ACK is 14 bytes. That would take 334 microseconds, giving us a throughput of just less than 36 megabits per second. So in this case, with 11G, data rate is 54 megabits per second, throughput 36 megabits per second. Note here I assumed that ACK was sent at the full data rate, 54. In some of the other calculations, we said it was sent at 6. In an exam question, I would say, what is the control rate, or what is the rate at which ACKs are sent? So you can't get better than this. Okay. In fact, most cases, it will be worse than this, because we also have some deference sometimes and some collisions. So this is the best case we can achieve. If we have RTS-CTS, there's an, an additional interframe space, RTS and CTS time. So the total time increases, therefore the throughput goes down. And we need to consider collisions and deference. Yep. In this, Example calculation, yes, I set it as the data rate. It's the best case we can do. I think in some devices you can set such that all devices, all transmissions will use the maximum. But I think it's probably incompatible with the older devices. Okay. So this 54 here, <coughs> the rate at which the ACK was sent, I've set it as the fastest possible for this calculation. But the standard normally requires you to send it at a lower rate. It may vary, depending upon the physical layer. So we normally use the rate that it, someone tells you, I think. Uh, if, if, no, if nothing's said, you use the data rate, use the same. So if I say the data rate is 54, and nothing about the control rate, or the ACK data rate, then use 54. 
uh, it depends upon nowadays it depends more upon the implementation some optimizations I think can use a higher rate here but in the original standard it was much lower than the maximum data rate okay. of course the data size may vary as well it is 1500 bytes it may be a different size and that would change the performance Maximum payload in the wireless LAN frame is 2,312 bytes. But because our wireless LAN normally connects to an Ethernet network, a wired LAN, the maximum in a wired LAN is normally 1,500. So in practice, usually in a wireless LAN, the maximum is 1,500. It's limited by, by the other network we connect to. So if you capture packets, or if you observe packets in a wireless LAN, I don't think you'll see larger than 1,500 in most cases. So the throughput, the payload divided by the time it takes to deliver that payload. I think the other issues we're not going to cover. Security we're not going to, going to cover. There are other issues, for example, more practical issues of how many access points do you need to cover some area? What should the RTS threshold be? How do you cover a large area with multiple access points? For example, different frequencies and so on. How do you provide security? How do you give priority to applications? They're all important issues but we will not try and cover them in this course. So there are many other features of wireless LANs that try to address these. The one, in fact the one or two last things that we'll mention, it's somehow related here, is with our throughput, for example our 36 megabits per second approximately, that's our, let's say, our network throughput. You have an access point and you have one client sending data to that access point, then according to this calculation, the best throughput we can get is about 36 megabits per second. What if I have an access point and two clients sending to the access point? What's the best throughput that each client could get. Two laptops associate to an access point and want to send data via that access point. What's the best throughput that your, access, your client could get, your laptop, approximately? Let's draw that. So let's say an access point and one client and we get approximately 36 megabits per second. Another scenario, one access point, two clients, no hidden terminals, keep it simple. What will client one get approximately? Throughput. If no collisions, okay, keep it simple. If there are no collisions, client one should get client one thirty six and client two. Twice two times too much. Eighteen and eighteen is about what they'll get. They must share that thirty six amongst them. And that's shown in most of our diagrams here. We'll come back to a simple one. Uh, here just with, say, B is our access point, A and C want to send. The way the MAC protocol works, if it works well and there are no collisions, is that just one station is sending at a time. We see that here. 
A is sending its data, then C is sending its data. And then maybe A wants to send more data, A then C, all right? They may alternate. Uh, maybe A gets to send two before C gets to send. But the idea, only one station is sending at a time. So this 36 megabits per second, we can think of, of as the network throughput. If there are two stations, that must be divided amongst them. You could calculate it here, and I think we did calculate similar, that from 0 through to 614, the network throughput is the 2 times our 1,100, 2,200 bytes divided by our 614. Half of the time A is sending its data, half of the time C is sending its data. So effectively C1 gets 18 megabits per second and C2 gets 18. The network throughput is 36. The way the Mac works, only one station sends at a time, so we are effectively dividing this network throughput amongst those stations. C1, C2, C3. What do we get? The network, best we can get is 36. Each station only transmits one third of the time. In this example, A is sending its data, if we consider the, the data transfer time, A is sending half of the time. The other half, B is, uh, C is transferring its data. If we had three stations, A would be transferring a third of the time, station two a third of the time, station three a third of the time. So with three stations, 12, 12, and 12. So we effectively divide that network throughput um, by the number of stations. And that gives you the per station or per client throughput. Maybe one, one way to draw that. Still see many confused faces. Without drawing the details like we have on the screen, if we considered many data frames between A and C, I will not draw B, the receiver. A has its data transfer period. So this is the total time from 0 up to 361. And then C got to send its data. And then if they have more data to send, maybe it's A. And then C, maybe A. And maybe A gets two times to transmit. And C. If the MAC works well, only one of those two are transmitting at a time. So over some large time period, A is trans transmitting half of the time, B is, C is transmitting half of the time. Therefore, they get 50% of that throughput. In general, with N stations, we divide that network throughput by N to get the per station throughput. In practice, you have an access point with 10 laptops associated and transferring data, then that throughput of, say, 36 megabits per second is divided by those 10 stations, 3.6 each. The more users you add, the less each individual user gets. It's, in fact, even worse, because this considers clients sending to the access point but also the access point needs to send to the clients. So it's even less per station. In fact, it'll be divided by four. Access point gets a quarter, C1, C2, C3 all get one quarter. 
if we consider all four of them sending. So in general, the number of stations sharing the medium must share that throughput amongst them. The more stations, the less per station throughput. In, yep. in, in the MAC protocol, an access point and a client are treated the same. So an access point is just another station. So in our, my case, I said B, right, B could be the access point in this case. It follows the same rules. Uh, in practice, normally clients send to the access point and access point sends to the clients. So we'd consider this, in fact, four stations wanting to send. It's even worse than that because often the access point sends much more than the client send. So it gets more complex than just dividing by four in that case. If there were three clients sending, access point for some reason didn't want to send any data, then it would get this 12. If there were three clients sending and the access point was wanting to send the same amount as each of those clients, then it would be 36 divided by four being nine. In practice, the access point often sends much more than the client, an individual client. So we cannot always easily calculate like that. Yep. So this percentage is the full duplex uh, barrel rate. Mm. We have to divide by two for this upping and downing. Uh, no, that, that's this issue with, um, let's say, if, see, if the clients want to upload a file, okay, all clients are trying to send to an access point and out to the internet, then an access point has nothing to send in response, then we'd get approximately this, 36 divided by the three clients wanting to send, 12 each. If now C1, C2 and C3 are sending the access point and also the access point is sending some data to them and the access point is sending about the same amount as each client, then it will be 36 divided by 4. We effectively have four stations wanting to send and it will be 9 each, 9 for the access point, 9 for C1, C2 and C3. So. The access point would get the same as the individual clients there, and that's where the, the the half duplex situation arises. In reality, it's more complex in that normally access point is sending much more than the clients, and it's hard to calculate what the answer will be in that case. This is just an approximation. The best rule to remember: you divide the network throughput by the number of stations that want to send data. Okay. That brings us to the end, I think. Any questions? In the last 10 minutes, let's say some things uh, before any, any further questions about the exam. Um, as I said earlier, I haven't written the exam yet, so I don't have any hints, but other than saying it will be similar to previous year's exams or similar types of questions, uh, by Monday, at the latest, I'll send an email to the list saying some hints about what's in the exam after I've written the exam. Um, but it will cover well, the three topics that we've covered, but of course, in each of them in some detail. Yep. And that's the next thing. Yes, the assignment will be covered in the exam. So everyone has set up their access point. They know how it works. There may be some very basic questions about the access point. Very, very basic. Nothing uh, that I don't think you would have uh, not seen. 
Um, for example, what, what is the maximum data rate supported by your access point? Okay, so or what standard is supported by your access point? Um, but not much harder than that about the assignment. What the assignment will do is, uh, now that we've finished covering how wireless LAN performance works, straight after the midterm, you will have to measure the performance and report upon that. So that will come straight after the midterm. But maybe you know, one or two very short questions about the access point or about uh, some practical aspects of wireless LANs.